The typo? Did you see the typo up there? It's turn your swords into plowshares, not turn your plowshares into swords. The, uh, <clears throat> so I just, that some of you may have thought that was weird. Some of you have heard that so many times when we, when we do uh, take guns here and we dismantle them and turn them into garden tools. And that seems like it's a, a focus for peace for our world. In this context, it's people who their farms have been destroyed. And, and, and God is saying like, okay, let's stop messing with this violence over here and let's rebuild, let's make, let's make farms again. Let's make lives again. That's where that is, just to clarify. Um, okay, so every once in a while, it's pretty rare, but every once in a while, a preacher will prepare something, and then uh, stuff happens, and Sunday morning, they, we call it a Sunday morning special, where you just rewrite the whole sermon. Um, <laughs> Miriam, you've done that? Yeah. Uh, I considered it. You've done it, Ken? Yep, yeah. I considered it, um, but I went against it, because I wanted to, to, to to have some regularity. Uh, we have a series going on here. If you've been here so far this year, many of you have been thinking harder about what religion means. Over these last few weeks, like, we took the Bible, explained the whole thing, no questions. We took God, covered it completely. Heaven and hell, everyone understands it now, right? So, so we're on a roll, uh, and I figured, you know, we, we have deconstructed a lot of bad thinking and 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 we've tried to reconstruct ideas of wholeness and well-being with a better sense of history and, and how to think about God. So what's left? Um, well, today I figured, I, I prepared, I didn't want to uh, throw this one out. Um, we're going to tackle Jesus and the Holy Spirit. We're going to get that all down. So we're just hitting all the highlights. Um, it'll be a little roundabout to get to Jesus and the Holy Spirit, but we're going to start with yet another funky little book that has been set aside and treated like a monster so much of its history. And today we're going to look in that little book and we're going to find seeds of Christ uh, as the grounding and the pattern by which any of us can heal and survive and blossom and find new life. And today we're going to find these little hints of the spirit uh, that follows and encourages and strengthens us and inspires us to be more than we thought maybe we could be and to become uh, the, the kind of dream that God has for us. Okay, so these funky little books. I, I've used this analogy a few times, but think of Star Wars. Uh, there is an order to start. There's many different ways to order Star Wars. You can put, like, how they came out from 1977 until today. You can mix them around and put them kind of chronological in that fantasy world. You could have them on your shelf with alphabetical or what's your favorite, all these different ways. And it's the same with our funky books. Uh, in your Bible, this one, Joel, is tucked kind of toward the middle of those prophets between two others that were written like 750 years uh, before Jesus. Somebody put it there a long time ago because Joel almost ends with a quote that sort of begins with Amos, and that's fine. Ancient Jews can put the books wherever the heck they want them in their Old Testament, their Hebrew Bible. Um, but the history that these books describe, uh, it goes like this. A long time ago, about 586, a bunch of Jewish prisoners, we've talked about this every week a little bit, these Jewish prisoners were dragged from Jerusalem to modern-day Iraq. Um, a lot of prophets, a lot of the books of the Bible talk about that, or they talk to those people, offering consolation. And then um, Zechariah, the one we did a couple weeks ago, next to last in your Old Testament, probably, he writes to their grandkids who are coming back to Israel to rebuild, to restart, to have new life there. And his message? God has been at work in your life. God is at work in your life. God will be at work in your life. Beautiful. So then fast forward. Last book probably in your Old Testament, uh, Malachi. Um, unless you're Jewish or Catholic or you have a fancy study Bible. Malachi writes to those people's grandkids, okay, a few generations, because they had believed. They took, they took Zechariah's advice. They tried hard, and now they're frustrated. They had worked hard, and now they're tired. They had done everything, not necessarily right, but they, they had integrity. They did, they did their job, and yet favor was not shining down on them. So Malachi says, hold on, be hopeful. You have a path forward. He says, imagine what it would be like if, if God, in your frustration, burned away all the barriers to your liberation. Okay, that's, that's how we described hell last week. God burning away all the barriers to your liberation, all the ones out there, all the ones in here that hold us back. Okay, that's good news. So fast forward again. Those people's grandkids, 
That's who Joel is writing to. Those people who've grown up sort of with that message for, on, on grandma's, you know, in grandma's storytelling in the kitchen. So Joel is the last chronological book of our Old Testament, even though it's slotted back there. And those people, two generations after Malachi, they had continued to work hard. They had continued to, to trust in God's vision. They held on to hope so hard for, you know, whatever that is, 70 years. But, but, sometimes there are some big buts in a church. Mm -hmm. uh, sometimes you say the right things, you do the right things, you feel the right things, but there's a big but that just drops right in the middle of it and throws your life into disarray. Uh, and I don't care how religious you are, I don't care if you've been going to church your whole life, everyone will come up to a but that rocks your world. Uh, I hear about, I hear about, I love my wife, but she left. And I don't know what it all meant for the years before. I hear, um, I've gone to church for 62 years, I've never smoked, I barely even curse, now I have cancer, and I think, did I just waste all that goodness? I hear, I believe in life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. I believe in standing for the flag, but all of a sudden I see that America has problems that I never noticed before. I hear, you know, I, I don't just believe. I know God has a plan. I know God wants peace in this world. I know it. But, gosh, there's a lot of chaos in my life, and it's just hard to keep knowing all the time. And you start to question so whatever it was, whatever is the story in your life, your butt story, that's, that's the people who Joel is talking to, people who have come to the final, last straw. Come on, God, I, I did everything I could. Where are you now? That's the feeling. Um, and I'm sure some of you, you know, you, you understand what it's like when you get there. For them, this last straw with God, it, it's, it's a triple whammy. One, it's all those locusts. We don't really know what all those words mean in the four kinds of locusts that Connie read about. Um, but, but if you're a gardener and you like cultivate and you work and you, it takes so long to grow those things and then some stupid deer comes and eats it, that's not a cute deer. Like Bambi should get out of here. This is my food, okay? So you get, okay. So they had that, but then, but then uh, you, okay, we're gonna, we're gonna redo it. It's okay. And then the rains don't come. So it's already a desert and now no rain. So there's no more food there. And then it's not really a war, but there's some kind of military invasion. We don't know the details about, but these people who are already hungry or like they have to de they have to defend themselves that's that's too much and for the people some people had some food you might do we have a like a, a box our in-laws gave us of like food in case the crazy times hit you know and we can have that food right is that good would you want to eat that for a long time you know back in back in joel's day they didn't get that at costco they had all the old grain they stuffed it in the basement and that was there it's not healthy it's not fresh uh, so either you starved, or you got sick, or you got stabbed by an enemy. Which one you want? And notice, part of the reason that we collect food, a lot of you have been bringing cans, thank you for the Super Bowl of caring. Part of the reason that we collect food is, is not just so people have something to eat, something isn't enough. Uh, a lot of poor people can aff afford cheap food. You know the easiest food to buy is like peanut butter and rice, or McDonald's? But that's not life-giving, that's life-damaging in a lot of ways. Uh, the thing about cheap food is it's cheap. Uh, and so we want, we want so, sometimes it's the kind of food we share that helps somebody really have more full of a life. So when you go and, and get some things this week for Super Bowl of Caring, uh, think on that. So the Israelites, um, you might know what it's like to be hungry. Uh, you know what it's like when I'm hungry and I uh, am worn out on a Sunday and we have a meeting at 1230 and I'm frustrated and I get a little hangry is the fantastic word we, that is developed. Okay, that's like hunger. These people are hungry. Totally different world. And if you are starving... And it's more than annoyances, it's, it is life-threatening things, and the bad food is running out, and you have no reason for optimism, it is an easy move to go from singing a praise song to, God, I am done with you right now. My, my grandparents could deal with it, their grandparents could deal with it, I am done. 
Or for you, maybe it's, uh, you know, anyone can deal with trauma for a day. Yeah, everyone here has the capacity when someone triggers something in the depths of your grief, you can hold your face together. You can hold it together till you get to the car, okay? Um, but when you are overwhelmed over and someone keeps driving it in your face, and then you suffer some major loss. It's hard to get up from that. Or maybe, you know, you have a hundred questions about God, totally healthy. I love it when people have great questions about God. But when you have that, and then something else pushes you over the edge to the point where you feel drowned by doubt, it's easy to let go of any trust in a loving God. So in the midst of that kind of cultural, I've had it moment, Joel's response to people on the brink, it's, it's kind of it's three steps. First, let's just find some stability, like that call to worship. What can you do when you're in doubt? Where do you find your grounding? Uh, the corner over here said just take a breath, right? Just take a breath. When you're struggling, uh, you might hear just get some good sleep, okay? I'm terrible at that, but get some good sleep when you're struggling. Uh, drink some water, take a walk, see the sunshine. Later, text a friend, listen to some good music. All the, you know what, what those do to actually solve your problems? Nothing. Nothing. But they bring you to a place of stability. They don't address your crisis. Uh, they're not going to heal you. They're not going to fill your bank account back up. They might not do anything. But Joel's first advice is, is get solid, S slow down the bleeding, uh, prepare yourself so that you can face these problems more. Now, in the wrong hands, Joel and the other prophets can sound like, repent because you are a sinner, so go back to following the rules. That's, that's, but his first point is, let's slow down and prove to ourselves that we have some control in a chaotic world, because you can control taking a breath. You can control drinking some water. Y you can control going to bed on time. I, I know it's hard, but you can do it. And that's good advice whether you believe anything about this book, anything about Jesus, who I promise is still coming today. I promise. So Joel's third point, um, now, I, I'm skipping one. Um, Joel's third point, now that you have some basis of stability, even though life is rough, uh, now that you have that going for you, let's visualize. We're going to get through this. I don't know how, but what dream does God have for us? I don't have the answer. I don't have the evidence for how we're going to get there, but um, we're going to thrive. What's it going to look like? Uh, we're not only going to hold on to the meager things we have, like the grain in the basement. We're going to restore our health. We're going to remember how to love. We are going to rediscover hope for the future. And of course, in those, those kind of encouraging words in the wrong hands at the wrong time can sound callous totally callous. People interpret Joel, people interpret the prophets so poorly. Some preachers interpret the Bible so negatively. I'm going to give you another Star Wars analogy. If you watched all the Star Wars and you came away with it thinking, like, it's all about Darth Vader, you just got it wrong. Don't argue with me that it's about Darth Vader. You just got it wrong. And, so, and then if you watch the Star Wars and you think, oh, the point of this is to prop up the emperor no matter what. The point of this is to build more Death Stars of hate against the princesses and against the aliens and against anyone who is not robotically white with a gun. That ain't the point of Star Wars, and it ain't the point of the Bible. In the right hands, these prophets are saying, if you listen through the lens of God on your side, when you are preparing for one more chance of life, Joel's vision is restoration. And that is a powerful tool for resilience. So Joel's process for people dealing with trauma and grief, he brings us back to a baseline and he gives us a vision for the future. That's steps one and steps three. In the middle, this is the big question. How do we get from here to there? How do we go from one to the other? And he barely has subtle hints. His book is an exercise in fill in the blanks. You have the wisdom. From stability to vision, you tell me how you're going to get there. What's your grounding going to be when it all falls apart? Which you know it will. Again, it's going to fall apart again. What's your guidance going to be when you get lost? Which you will again. Okay? And the answer, our answer for today, and we're going to do it in the Hebrew, uh, your grounding is the Messiah. That would be the prophet's answer. 
Your, your, your guidance is the Ruach Elohim, the most fun word to say in Hebrew. Uh, say it after me, Ruach Elohim. Give me that good Ruach. You're almost there. We're trying. It's, it's, it's really hard. It's a fun word to say, Ruach. Uh, it, means, it means a spirit of the Lord. Now, the Christian foundation is that somehow, some way, Jesus is this Messiah. Jesus is this Christ. And the Holy Spirit is somehow the animating work of God in our world. Not separated into some other world, but it's right here. It's, it's closer to you than your heartbeat. But whether you believe any of that, whether Joel dreamed in those ways, I'll reframe the answer. One, God has a pattern for how the world is knit together in love. And I believe, maybe we believe, maybe some of you want to believe, maybe some of you are just invited to believe that that pattern of love that's knit together in the world put on a face and showed us a way, showed us the way. Okay? And B, too, we believe that whatever the mystical details there are that we only kind of grasp at in the dark, we believe that the Spirit is, a, is of guidance and of support and is so close to you and it will not fail. Now, to be clear, Joel does not actually use the word Messiah. I, possibly uh, other problems. Isaiah just, he says it all the time. Oh, my gosh. He just, Messiah, Messiah, suffering Messiah. This Messiah is going to do. Messiah of peace. Messiah this. Okay. Some prophets just overuse it. And maybe in those 400 years, the word lost its sauce. Okay, maybe. So maybe um, it's like, you know, when I was in college, they told us that the important, like, here's the way to be a good person, tolerance. Okay? Is tolerance the highest value these days? No. We've moved past that. It's, that's, a, that's a minimizing thing. Um, so maybe by 375, people have been waiting for so long that the idea of a hero didn't matter. Or maybe Joel is leaving that blank open so that, so that the people are like, oh, yeah, it's a Messiah. That's the way to connect one to two. Maybe that realization of a peaceful leader, symbol, idea will help them knit their lives in love. Or maybe these little echoes that Joel leaves about turning swords into garden tools, uh, that's a quote from Isaiah, and there's no way that they could miss that connection with the Messiah in the words like that. So whatever is his literary strategy, Joel is just inviting us to plant our own seeds of hope in the fertile ground of God's dream. Joel is saying that we can cultivate these steps toward our own restoration alongside God's like big, big, big plan for the restoration of all things. Joel believes it deep, deep down, buried beneath our sorrow, buried beneath the bitterness, buried beneath the hopelessness, deep down, we know the shape of redemption. We know how to take those steps. And now in our world, that can mean that we point ourselves toward Jesus and we partner with the Spirit. And sure, I know that Jesus gets a lot of other labels and a lot of other weird things stuck onto him. We, we, we can't like erase all of those or explain all of those away. Uh, a lot of those are off-putting. But simply be invited that there is a place of stability in the chaos of life, and there is a place of beloved community in God's reign. And if there's any line between those two, however twisting and twirling it might be, uh, I believe that it runs through the life of Jesus, who was anointed to be peace on earth. And I believe as we follow those twists and turns, we do that neither alone nor simply with ancient stories, but we walk it with a spirit alive, the same spirit that walked with Jesus and with Joel, the same spirit that has walked with us to this point. Amen.